Welcome to the second video on the Middle Ages. Now in this video we're going to take a brief look at the outline for the entire series that I'm going to do on the Middle Ages. Now the first series of videos will be a prelude series and that will consist of about six or seven videos as you can see here. I may add a few subjects to this, we will see, but we'll start out in this video of course with the church. Then we will look at towns and villages during the Middle Ages, castles, and then weapons, the night, and then finally we'll end up with medieval art. And then we'll move on to the timeline portion of the series, and we'll start out appropriately with the Franks. Now I may switch this up a little bit too, we will see, but this will be the general outline for the entire series. Now the church had a monumental impact on the Middle Ages, perhaps more than any other age in history. And with the fall of Rome, you had a breakdown in central authority. And it was the church that filled in and ruled society through law, through governance, they even set up their own courts. And the church acted as a unifying element in a very chaotic world. During the Middle Ages, the church provided welfare to the sick and poor, and also knowledge was contained in the church, specifically in the monasteries. Now, I don't want to suggest it was all good. The church, much later on in the Middle Ages, became very wealthy, and that became a source of discontent for a lot of people. And, of course, that would eventually lead to the Reformation. Now, the church was the center of the town. If you had traveled back in time to the Middle Ages, and you traveled to a small town, you would have been amazed to see all of these tiny little houses, and then stand standing out almost like a skyscraper would have been this massive stone church. And so that would have provided quite a contrast because the church was everything to this town. The people provided their labor, their money, and all of their time and efforts to the church. And so it really was the center of the town in every sense of the word. All weddings took place there, festivities, and not just church business, by the way, even town business would take place there. So as I said, it really was the center of existence for people in the Middle Ages. Now, since literacy rates dropped dramatically in the Middle Ages, it was the church and monasteries where education took place. Reading and writing were preserved at the church because it is reading and writing that is always associated with a dark period. And there have been many dark ages throughout time, but that is one of the characteristics of a dark ages, a step backwards in terms of reading and writing. And so you should remember that there were no more schools or universities like there had been in classical times. All of that was gone as reading disappeared. But as I said, it was preserved in the church. Now, early on in the Middle Ages, there was no middle class. You had the church, the feudal lords, and then the commoners. That was it. Eventually, much later on, you would see a middle class start to appear. Now, what we're going to do is take a look at the Christian church from the time of the 12 apostles and Jesus and take that all the way up to the time of the Middle Ages and some of the key figures in the Middle Ages in Western Europe. Now, after the death of Jesus, the apostles became the leadership of the church. And some important events happened. The first was the Pentecost. And you had all of these different tribes speaking different languages in different tongues. And so the birth of the church really occurred at Pentecost because the apostles could now be understood universally by many different tribes and people speaking different languages. And so this enabled them to spread the gospel. Now, in terms of the gospel, there were four gospels. And these were the writings that were used to teach people the life and times of Jesus. And so that could connect people to Jesus. Now, early on, there was a very important split in the church. Peter founded the church in Rome, and we'll talk about that in the next slide. And Andrew and Paul are associated with the Eastern Orthodox Church. And so that was a very important split early on. The Orthodox Church in the East, and of course that was located in Byzantium, and the Catholic Church, which of course was located in Rome. Now early on, the apostles made a very, very important decision. They had a huge impact on the Middle Ages. They held a council about who could be Christian. Now in the early Christian church, you had to be Jewish before you could convert to Christianity. All Gentiles, and Gentiles were basically anyone who was not Jewish, could not join the the Christian church. You had to be Jewish before you could convert to Christianity. That restriction was removed, and this really enabled Christianity to become ultimately what it became, a world religion. And had this restriction not been removed, Christianity undoubtedly would not have spread as it did throughout Western Europe during the Middle Ages, because as we know, most of the barbarian tribes were pagans. They were not Jewish. 
And the other big restriction removed was the diet. You no longer had to adhere to the kosher diet. And so again, these were very, very important early key decisions by the apostles. Now, one of the most important of the 12 apostles is, of course, Peter. It is Peter who Jesus gave the keys to the kingdom. And you can see that depicted in this painting right here. Now, it is Peter who ventured to Rome, during the time of Nero, of course, and founded the Catholic Church in Rome. And he becomes the first pope and the first bishop of Rome. And from that point on, there is a papal succession of popes after Peter. And that links the current pope all the way back to Jesus. So that's a very important connection. And it's called the primacy of the Pope. Now this is a painting, of course, of St. Peter's Basilica, which is one of the largest churches in the world and of course is located in Rome. Now according to tradition, St. Peter's tomb is directly below the altar of the Basilica. And so that is the reason that many Popes have been interred here. And that brings me to another topic, relics. Relics are the physical remains of a saint or any personal effects. So clothing, bones, anything that was associated with a saint could be preserved as a relic. And so if you travel across Europe to the various churches, you will find that many of these churches have relics. And relics were very, very important in the Middle Ages. It was believed that they were actually the physical body of a saint. And that if you came in contact with a relic, it could provide perhaps healing power. And like I said, it could be clothing or bones, and they all had this sort of supernatural power because they were thought to contain his or her spirit. And so, like I said, they could do all sorts of things, including healing and cure disease. And they even put fear into people. People were scared of relics. They could move entire armies in a particular direction because often the saints' bones would be put out on a battlefield. And if you didn't follow what the church wanted, you could be struck down by some of these relics. So especially in the Middle Ages, they put the fear in a lot of people. Now by tradition, St. Peter was killed by Nero in Rome and he was crucified upside down. And so he became a martyr. So martyrdom is another very important theme in the Christian church, and we'll get to that in the next slide. Now, as I said, martyrdom was an important theme in the early church, and it continues even up to today. Now, the early Christians were, of course, persecuted by the Romans. Nero is said to have done terrible things to the Christians. There were Christians who were crucified and set on fire so that Nero could light up his backyard. Some were literally fed to the lions. Others were put in gladiatorial games. And usually these involved a violent death. That's usually the common theme of a martyr. And one of the most important notions here was to be brave in the face of death. That was one of the important messages that these stories told. Now, there's also this idea to imitate Christ in martyrdom. So many martyrs, because of course, Christ on the cross is the first martyr in the Christian church. And so many other saints would imitate this idea of martyrdom. Peter, of course, as I said, is executed by Nero. And by tradition, he was going to be crucified. But he didn't want to imitate Christ completely. And so he requested to be crucified upside down because he didn't want to imitate Christ 100% in martyrdom. And so the Romans fulfilled his wish. He was crucified upside down. Nero also had Paul executed, and he is beheaded. Now, martyrdom also continued well into the Middle Ages, and we will talk about this in future videos. There are several saints that suffer very violent deaths. Now, one of the key figures for Christianity during Roman imperial times was the Emperor Constantine. Now, a very important event occurred for Constantine in 312 AD, right before the pivotal battle of the Milvian Bridge. And before the battle, Constantine saw a cross of light above it. And of course, he took this to mean that the Christian God was on his side during his battles with the other Roman generals. And of course, he was victorious at the Battle of Milvian Bridge. Now, in the Middle Ages, there is a tradition that Constantine painted crosses on the shields of his soldiers, and this led him to victory. Now, just one year later, Constantine issued the Edict of Milan, and that had a momentous impact on the spread of Christianity, because now Christianity, for the first time, was allowed in the Roman Empire, and so Christianity spread very quickly throughout the empire. 
Now, about 10 years later, Emperor Constantine convened the first Council of Nicaea, and this was to decide a great theological debate that occurred in the early Christian church, and this involved the Arian question. Arianism was taught by Arius, and this involved the relationship between God the Father and Jesus as the Son of God. Now, Arianism taught that God the Father and Jesus Christ as the Son of the God were separate entities. And Arius further asserted that Jesus as the Son of God was a subordinate entity to God the Father. And so the key point here is that they are separate entities. Now, there was another side that supported the Trinity, and that was that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost shared one essence. And so essentially it was three persons, but one being. And so this side of the debate rejected Arianism. The council eventually adopted the Nicene Creed, which supported the Trinity. And you can see that right here in this painting on the right. And right in the middle there is Constantine holding the creed. But Arianism did not go away, and it persisted into the Middle Ages. And we will talk about this in later videos when we talk about the various Germanic tribes, because many of the Germanic tribes adopted Arianism as their creed. So as I said, we will discuss that in future videos. Now, in the early Middle Ages, there were two important figures in church history, St. Benedict and Pope Gregory. And we'll get to Pope Gregory in the next slide. Now, in terms of Benedict, he had a very important role on monasticism in the early Middle Ages. And of course, he wanted to live the life of a monk. And these were men who left the outside world to live in a secluded monastery. Now, before Benedict, monks lived rather privileged lives. And Benedict saw this as a problem. He believed that monks should submit to God and so that excesses should be avoided. And so Benedict and his followers built a monastery called Monte Cassino. And this was on top of a mountain. And here they lived a very, very secluded life. And it was here that he established the Benedictine Order, which became one of the most important orders in the Middle Ages. Monks who lived at this monastery lived in a life of solitude, prayer, and reading. And they would live a life of hardship, giving up all of their earthly pleasures. And usually, as I said, only one meal was consumed with some ale. And often there was only one warming room in the entire monastery. So it was a difficult and very hard existence. But that was the life that Benedict believed that monks should live. And if they did that, they would submit to God. Now, Benedict wrote down all of these rules, and it subsequently became known as the Rule of St. Benedict. And that became one of the most influential set of religious rules in the Western Church. And so other monasteries throughout Western Europe and during the Middle Ages adopted the rule of St. Benedict. And so Benedict had a monumental impact on the Middle Ages, so much so that the early Middle Ages are often called the Benedictine centuries. Now, there were other orders established as well. There was the Cistercian order, who were often called the white monks. Now, Benedictine monks often wore a black robe. Now, also, there were the Franciscans, and these were friars. Now, friars were a little bit different than monks. They usually traveled from town to town and often placed themselves with the common people, whereas monks often lived in seclusion in monasteries. Now, another important figure in the early Middle Ages was Pope Gregory I, and he is often listed as one of the most influential popes of all time. Now, Gregory was the first pope from a monastic background, and it was Gregory who placed a lot of emphasis on missions, and so he dispatched Augustine to Britain to convert the Anglo-Saxons to Christianity. He also worked to establish papal supremacy in Western Europe, and the reason for this was that the Byzantines had a lot of influence on the papacy from 537 to 752 AD. AD. In fact, popes required the approval of the Byzantine emperor. But slowly but surely, the Western church began to move away from the Byzantines. And in their own right, the Vatican became more and more powerful. Now, it's complicated because initially the pope did not have a lot of power in terms of a military. It was the Franks who really had the most political influence. But the pope had a major weapon in his arsenal, 
and that was excommunication. And that threat alone gave the Pope an enormous weapon in his arsenal because excommunication was about the worst thing that could happen to you. Because if you were excommunicated, there was no chance to make it into heaven. In fact, sinners were cast into this deep pit of flames and fire. And of course, they would suffer numerous torments by the way of demons. So it was in your best interest to listen to what the Pope had to say because if you didn't, you just might be excommunicated. Okay, that is going to do it for this video. I will see you guys in the next video.